um, in, in the Noahide side, what we have accomplished so far is to introduce the Noahide side as differentiated, perhaps, from the Jewish side. But when we get right down to it, the Jewish side and the Noahide side are the exact same covenants. They are the exact same religions, different jobs in the same religion. Now, <clears throat> much is made that a Noahide is, a, um, is part of the uh, kingdom of heaven, yes, and that a Noahide and a Jew have different jobs. Well, that is true to some degree, just the same way as a, as a Jew and a Cohen have different jobs. A regular a rank and file Jew and a Levite have different jobs. A uh, rank they, there are six hundred and thirteen mitzvot, two uh, two hundred and two of which can only be performed by the uh, Kohanim or the Levites. I I am informed. Well, some people think that there are only um, uh, seven mitzvot that the Noahides um, keep. That is not exactly correct. In a future class I will be making a construct of um, hundreds of mitzvot that are kept by Noahides, by devout Noahides. I, I am an avowed Ben Noach. I have taken a, a vow to keep the uh, mitzvot according to the oral tradition of Moses. Some rabbis don't like that. They don't like uh, Noahides to keep the oral traditions according to the oral traditions of Moses. They want someone, they want a Noahide to keep seven laws according to the rabbis. Uh, then there are, as, as I can remark, there are a number of differences, distinct differences. Yet um, I, I love those rabbis who say that Noahide should keep the mitzvot only in accordance with the will of, of certain rabbis. Well, we'll uh, as we get further on, we'll see that there are a, a good number of mitzvot that can apply to uh, everyone. In, in the last number of weeks, we have been talking about the book of Yonah. And uh, the, uh, the, the text I have been using is, is, is out of the Art Scroll book on Yonah, which is a very popular book. And I'm going to be continuing to um, read a little bit from this book tonight. In addition, I have also, I'm also probably going to continue on with a construct um, uh, uh, on the book of Yonah. We will continue on our studies with the, um, the Art Scroll book of Yom Kippur. And uh, while I'm at it, I will show you the uh, edition of the Bible that I'm on. And that is the Art Scroll edition of the, uh, the, the, the stone edition of the Torah. It is uh, produced by the Art Scroll people. A lot of times we find that uh, different, that vast distinctions can occur. Vast, I'm going to say differences, can occur between uh, editions of the Bible. Well, <clears throat> I, I urge you to get on a, a good, accurate edition of the Bible. Now, that's not to say that your edition of the Bible is not accurate. Whatever edition of the Bible you are on, I encourage you to read it more. However, I did want to clarify what edition I am on. <clears throat> Tonight, I intend to, um, to um, tie in to the book of Yonah, the, um, uh, something from the book of Exodus. And that is what I started last week, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the tie-in of the 13 attributes of God from the book of Exodus. And uh, have a, I have a couple of downloads here that are available to anyone online. Um, this, this is... Um, 13 Attributes of God's Compassion by Moshe Ben Asher, Ph.D. <clears throat> and I also have uh, uh, downloaded something, the 13 Attributes of Mercy, from um, the uh, good people at Wikipedia, which you are probably also very familiar with, 13 Attributes of Mercy from Wikipedia. And I also have the, have the original Torah version in front of us. <clears throat> I'm going to give a little bit of clarification about the Noahide side. I'm going to read for a short bit um, out of the Art Scroll book on Yonah, and this is written by a very qualified man, Rabbi Nassim Sherman, who is the author of a, um, a good percentage of the uh, Art Scroll publications. 
in um, on on page um, in the introduction on page uh, Roman numeral twenty four, he begins uh, the um, uh, Roman numeral two Jonah's message, and he 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 says that if you want to follow along with me, if you happen to have the text, but uh, for those of you who don't, the sages have un have um, united the book of Jonah with repentance and Yom Kippur. The prophet, the sailors, the Ninevites, all teach eternal lessons of repentance. From the repentance of Nineveh, which was sincere by its own standards, to the dedication of Yonah, whose greatness drove him to sacrifice spiritual growth and life itself for the sake of God's honor and Israel's, the book is replete with teachings that go beyond time, that go beyond nationality, and go beyond geography. <clears throat> I'm going to repeat that former sentence. From the repentance of Nineveh, which was sincere by its own standards, to the dedication of Yonah, whose greatness was evident, the book of Yonah is replete with teachings that go beyond time, that go beyond nationality, and go beyond geography. I am. Um, uh, I repeated that because I, I think it's uh, very important to note that repentance and um, Yom Kippur, atonement, are universal. Now, the the uh, to continue on with Rabbi uh, Nason Sherman's comments in the introduction, the Book of Yonah does not tell us where the prophet lived, what part of uh, Eretz Israel he was from the nationality of the sailors, or the country where Nineveh was located. Whatever we know about these historical phenomena, we piece together from other sources. The book itself does not tell us, for these details matter but little. The story happened at a specific time in a particular place, but its implications are universal. Now here we have a, a, um, uh, a, a uh, prolific author author of, of a very well-received publishing company, indicating to us that um, the story happened at a specific time in a particular place, but its implications are universal. Uh, let's think of some other things that are universal. I think that, I think that um, uh, Rabbi Sherman here is uh, very... Um, candid, but yet he does couch some of his remarks a little bit later on. And let's see if you can pick it up in the introduction. And, and, and in the college that I went to, we learned to think critically, whether we were taking a literature class or, or a philosophy or a, whatever we were taking, we were taking history, we were taking science, we learned to think critically. And this is in this uh, introduction from page Roman numeral 24 of the Art Scroll book on Yonah it is an exercise in critical thinking. The book of Yonah does not tell, uh, for these details matter but little. The, uh, the implications are universal, as we said before. Repentance preceded creation of the earth. Rabbi Sherman points out. Interesting. I, ha I did not know that until I read this book. Repentance preceded creation of the earth. It is timeless. So too the story of Yonah is beyond the bounds of space and time. Its lesson is the timeless lesson of repentance, which he indicates is universal. Fascinating that this is not taught as being a Noahide tradition. Fascinating that it is, and I, I'm going to continue on and see if you can pick it up. Such is the universal and timeless message of Yonah. It is a message of sincerity and purity, read at a time when God sits on the throne of mercy, anxious to bestow compassion upon his one unique nation, if only they pierce their hearts with a needle's point of repentance. 
May he open wide his gates of mercy, and may the angelic purity of Israel's Yom Kippur spill over to become the soothing waters of redemption. I wonder if you saw the um, a a s somewhat of an apparent inconsistency. Now, now Rabbi Sherman is not here to to discuss this with us. Unfortunately, I I, I would love to attend a lecture by the by the gentleman, um, a com complete scholar as he seems to be. First, he calls um, Yom he, he he calls Yonah a timeless book, universal in its nature. But then he, he um, almost with a certain, dare I say, myopia. His vision narrows in his summary paragraph, where he says, Such is the universal and timeless message of Yonah. It is a message of sincerity and purity, read at a time when God sits on the throne of mercy, anxious to bestow compassion upon his one unique nation. If only they pierced their own hearts with a needle of repentance. Yes, <clears throat> Rabbi Sherman, I, 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 um, I, I don't want to sound entirely disrespectful, sir, but I am going to take issue with you. I disagree with you that um, that that uh, heaven is not only interested in the repentance of its one unique nation. There are people who even there are people close by, even people who are associated with this broadcast, who do not even feel uh, who who feel that Israel should not even be a political nation, as it were. Now I know that 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 you do because you or many of your staff do live in Israel. But it it it, it is my understanding that there are some people who have um, somewhat of an argument that. Um, that could be made, a, a, a constructive argument that could be made that, that Israel is not actually a, uh, correctly speaking, a nation, nor should it be. I know it is politically a nation today. <clears throat> it is further my uh, dispute with Rabbi Sherman, I, I dispute with him very respectfully, because I, I have a great deal of respect for this man, that um, it's not just uh, Israel, it's not just the Jew, who is to receive the um, repentance? It, uh, the or or the the um, it, it's not just the Jew who who should repent. It's all mankind, and this is proven in the fourth chapter of Jonah. Just to refresh, is that um, um, if I can uh, read very quickly. Just the, 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 the fourth chapter of Yonah. Hashem took pity on the uh, Kikion, the gourd plant. And uh, he made it grow, and it materialized overnight, and perished overnight, you recall, from the text. This is uh, Yonah chapter 4, verses 11. And I shall not take pity, and, and shall I not take pity on Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons, so you see, here we have the, um, the, the commentary by Harav David Feinstein points out that God's compassion attends to all, all of his creatures, according to Harav David Feinstein. As God said, in silencing the angels who wish to sing God's praises after the Egyptian drowned, the, the, God drowned all the Egyptians in the Sea of Reeds, um, Hashem is, is um, supposed to have said, my handiwork is drowning in the sea, and you presume to sing praise? Yes. There are times when we um, get uh, myopia, where we cannot see the, the broad picture. We cannot see the entirety of of the intent of the creation of heaven. There are times, and it's understandable, that, that we get um, occupied with learning a particular facet of Torah. We get occupied with learning a large number of facets of Torah. 
and we lose the 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 the, the large picture. We try and look at the at the needle on each pine tree that we embrace in the forest, and we and we study each tiny uh, chip of bark that is on that tree, and we study each root of each particular tree, but we cannot see the forest. Now, the, that's not all of our jobs. Our, all of our jobs is not to see the forest, you understand. But when we are making statements such as, and I've, I've heard it said, it's been said to me, um, Reverend Grattan, why don't you go all the way and convert to Judaism? Well, it's not the covenant under which I was born. Mr. Grattan, why don't you um, join us and become a Jew? Well, that's not what heaven ordained for me. I was not born a Jew. I was born a Noahide. I'm going to ask you to join with me in your Bibles, and if you can get to uh, Parshish Noah. And we're going to read the ninth chapter. I'll, I'll read it for you. The ninth chapter of Genesis. This is to reinforce the understanding of what the um, of, of of what the covenant of our birth is, unless you were born Jewish. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, "Be fruitful and multiply and fill the land." I've actually heard it said where some. Um, um, people have said, no, that, that that does not apply to Noahides. Fascinating. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens and everything that moves on the earth and in all the fish of the sea and, and in, in your hand they are given. Every moving thing, thing that lives shall be food for you like the green herbage I, herbage I have given you everything. But flesh with its soul, its blood you shall not eat. However, your blood, which belongs to your souls, I will demand of every beast, I will demand it. But of man, of every man, that for his brother, I will demand the soul of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God, he made man. Now, I've heard people say that uh, Noahides are not made in the image of God. I've heard um, uh, people say that Noahides do not have souls. And that's a common teaching. It, isn't that a, um, a distinction between what Moses said? Moses said, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, God made man. So yes, Noahides have souls. Okay, some of the teaching who, that, that um, you have heard um, contradicts that. Please give them my email address. My email address is Bereshis 6 underscore 8 at yahoo.com. Bereshis, the Ashkenazic spelling of Genesis, um, Bereshis 6 underscore 8 at yahoo.com. Continuing on with the ninth chapter of Genesis, now at verse 8, and God said to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your offspring after you. Now, isn't that fascinating that that the word in the art scroll is Brit. I establish my Brit with you and after your and with your offspring after you and with every living being that is with you, with the birds, with the animals, and with every beast of the land with you. Of all that departed the ark to every beast of the land, and I will confirm my Brit with you. Never again shall the flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I give between me and you, and every living being that is with you to generations forever. I have set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And it shall happen when I place a cloud over the earth, and the bow will be seen in the cloud, I will remember my covenant between me and you and every living being among all flesh, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, 
and I will look upon it to remember an everlasting covenant. Brit Olam, everlasting covenant between God and every living being among all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have confirmed between me and with all flesh on the earth. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark with Shem, Ham, and Yapheth, Ham being the father of Canaan, these three were the sons of Noah, and from, all the, and from these the whole world was spread out. The word covenant is used a total, I believe, of, of uh, seven times in the ninth chapter of Genesis. If there are people who say that it's not a real covenant and that it, um, it doesn't, it, it's not really valid anymore. Fascinating. That people are going around telling people that the covenant of Noah, and that, and that the, the, the rainbow covenant is not valid. Fascinating. They're, they're, they, I suppose that I would dispute them. However, um, I think it's apparent from the reading of the text that their dispute is not with me, that their dispute is with the author of this text. Now, the author of this text, as, as, as we know it, is, um, of course, is, is, is Moses. He, he, he penned it. Now, there's, one, there's another way to look at it, and that is, is that um, Moses uh, served actually as a sort of a secretary to the Creator. Yes. So that, that, that while Moses actually did write it, he actually took dictation from the Almighty. Yes. Now, let's just figure out when did Moses say this? <clears throat> when, when Moses was writing Genesis 9, uh, chronologically, when did he record it? Now we know that that um, this took place if 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 uh, Noah was ten generations from Adam, and uh, Abraham was ten generations from uh, Noah, and Moses was ten generations from Abraham. That would mean that uh, give or take a little, um, Moses was uh, twenty generations. From uh, from Noah. So so uh, chronologically, M Moses did not write this in the day of Noah. Chronologically, Moses wrote this obviously in his own lifetime, and in relation to the crossing of the Red Sea, in relation to the arrival of Jethro, in relation to. Um, the uh, giving of Torah. When did Moses write this? I think if we if we checked, Moses would have recorded this after he received the Torah at Sinai. Now that makes pretty good sense, doesn't it? Is that the Torah was written after Moses received it? Now that now that. That doesn't make sense to some people. Some people would tell you that when Moses wrote Genesis, he didn't. It, 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 he, he intended for it to be superseded by the covenant of Sinai. That's what some people teach. Well, um, I think that um, when Moses wrote the Torah, he wrote it after he received the Torah. And when he used the phrase, everlasting covenant, that was um, um, <clears throat> applicable to all mankind who, uh, who were descended from himself, Shem, Ham, and Yapheth, that um, this eternal covenant was applicable to all. And he wrote that very solemnly. Now, very frequently, we hear that if something is, is mentioned twice in a chapter, it is uh, considered to be uh, pretty important. And if it's third, uh, if it's mentioned three times in a particular chapter, we know that it has um, great um, significance. Moses used the word covenant 
in the ninth chapter of Genesis seven times. And he referred to it as an everlasting one. Now, there's some rabbis who teach, well, no, it's, it's not everlasting. It's, um, <clears throat> it, it applies uh, until um, you want it to. Right? It applies oh, only as far as um, you think it should. Fascinating. I'm going to refer you now to something else that Moses wrote, and that is in the book of Exodus. And this here is, uh, I'm going to be referring now to the, to the 13 attributes of God in the, in the 34th chapter of Exodus. I'll give you a minute or two to get your page open. This is in Parshish Kisisa. And starting reading uh, on uh, verse 34, I'm sorry, on, on chapter 34, verse 1. Hashem said to Moses, Carve for yourself two stone tablets like the first ones, and I shall inscribe on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you shattered. Be prepared in the morning. Ascend Mount Sinai in the morning and stand by me there on the mountaintop. Verse 3, no man may ascend with you, nor may anyone be seen on the entire mountain. Even the flock and the cattle may not graze facing that mountain. Verse 4, so Moses carved out two stone tablets like the first ones. Moses arose early in the morning and ascended to Mount Sinai, as Hashem had commanded him, and he took two stone tablets in his hand. Verse 5, Hashem descended in a cloud and stood with him there, and he called out with the name Hashem. Hashem passed before him and proclaimed, Hashem, Hashem, God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in kindness and truth, preserver of kindness for thousands of generations, forgiver of iniquity, forgiver of willful sin, and forgiver of error, and who cleanses, but does not cleanse completely recalling the iniquity of parents upon children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Then it continues, Moses hastened to bow his head toward the ground and prostrate himself. <clears throat> And that ends that passage that I'm going to be talking about. It is the 13 principles, you see. The I'm sorry, the not the 13 principles of faith, as, as Maimonides had, had written them. They, were the, they, they had been um, uh, adjusted by writers um, over the centuries, taking this passage from Exodus chapter 34, verses 5. Um, and continuing of the 13 attributes of mercy. Yes, the 13 attributes of mercy, which I'm going to refer now to, I'm going to be adjoining this study of, the, of um, Exodus 34, 5 with the principles of mercy, with the attributes of uh, the, the 13 attributes of mercy with the book of Yonah and how Yonah perceived Hashem's reaction to the uh, penitence of the Ninevites. It, here in this passage, um, in Yonah, we say that this is in the fourth chapter of Yonah, and I will, and I will read the, uh, the fourth chapter of Yonah, starting at the, at the last verse of the third chapter. And God saw their deeds, that they had repented from their evil way, and God relented concerning the calamity he had said he would bring upon the Ninevites, and did not act. This displeased Jonah greatly, and it grieved him. 
Yonah prayed to Hashem and said, Please, Hashem, was this not my contention when I was still on my own soil? I therefore had hastened to flee to, to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, and relentful of punishment. So now, Hashem, please take my life from me, for better is my death than my life. And Hashem said, Are you that deeply grieved? Yonah had left the city and stationed himself in the east of the city, and he made a booth there and waited. He waited out the 40 days to see if, if Hashem would destroy the Ninevites. And of course, anyone who's read the, the, the tale knows that the Ninevites were saved because they repented, and Hashem relented. Yes. Um, according to the scholars, um, the um, the uh, the uh, in the commentaries. Um, Hashem is forgiving. Literally, lifting up. Iniquity, rebellion or willful sin, and carelessness, he will forgive iniquity. He will forgive rebellion. He will forgive willful sin and carelessness or error. Not only does God provide forgiveness, but atonement, effectively short-circuiting, as Rabbi Hirsch has pointed out. God will short-circuit the natural process of cause and effect, so that when we do teshuva, turning from, the usual consequences of wrongdoing are lifted up from us. Yes. And um, uh, according to the, uh, the, the 13th attribute of Vinike, uh, it, God is one who cleanses. He cleanses us. When our teshuva is genuine and complete, the effects of our wrongdoing on us are completely removed. Isn't that fascinating? Isn't that fascinating? Speaking from the Noahide side, <coughs> you're gonna have to forgive me. I do speak from the Noahide side. After all, that is the that is the name of this program, isn't it? Rashi comments on the use of um, of of the ref of the reference to the um, um, attribute of mercy in relation to um, the Ninevites. Yes, a number of commentators have have taken up the observation of what uh, Yonah had experienced. Yonah knew that forgiveness was one of God's characteristics. And Yonah's uh, commentary in uh, verses um, uh, 3, 4, and 5 of the fourth chapter of Yonah, a call to mind the 13 attributes. Yes. Isn't it fascinating that some people say that in order to obtain the mercy of Hashem. One must be a Jew. Well, is, is that so? Is it? Is it really? Okay. Some people are, are convinced that um, Noahides um, um, cannot have a place in the world to come. Even in spite of um, commentators from the um, um, from the period of the Great Assembly, and these commentators said at length that um, if someone um, is, observes it is a Noahide, a Ger Teshav like myself, if someone is a Ger Teshav and follows the um, his portion of the Torah, much the same way as if someone is a Kohen and follows his portion of the Torah. 
If someone is a uh, Levite and follows his portion of the Torah, if someone is a, uh, a farmer, follows his portion of the Torah, if someone is a soldier and follows his portion of the Torah, if someone is a homemaker and a mother and follows her portion of the Torah, then there is mu as much place for that Noahide who follows their section of the Torah. There's as much place for them in the world to come as anyone who ever served as high priest. But yet there are some people who insist that in order to um, have life in the world to come, God does not hear the prayer of a Noahide. Some people teach that Noahides do not have souls. I, re I recollect when a Christian evangelist years ago on television commented that God does not hear the prayer of a Jew. How absurd. Honestly, God does not hear the prayer of a Jew. But yet uh, the, the teaching goes both ways, doesn't it? Some Jews teach that God does not hear the prayer of a Noahide or that a Noahide cannot have Torah fullness, cannot have Torah holiness. Nonsense. <clears throat> if you want to think that way, you can, but Yonah found out that his thinking was incorrect. And the city of Nineveh was saved, and it was um, then qualified to be the instrument, the rod of God's anger. We have a few more minutes. And I would like to invite observations, comments, and um, discussion ideas. We have about uh, 10 minutes remaining. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. See, so someone is writing a... Uh, a phone number. I'm not going to announce it over the air. Yes. I'm going to be um, uh, talking uh, next uh, class about uh, the Yom Kippur and its universality. Yes, wouldn't that be amazing if it were to turn out that um, uh, Yonah's visit to Nineveh actually correlated with the um, Day of uh, Atonement? Wouldn't that be fascinating? I, th I think it would. I think it would be amazingly fascinating if it were to turn out that the, the, the um, that Nineveh was saved on the Day of Atonement. We'll be talking more about uh, about atonement uh, from the the uh, art scroll book on Yom Kippur. I was at a um, Christian organizational meeting not that long ago, and a gentleman there was um, very kind, very generous, very warm, treated me very warmly, very openly. They were, they were just mag very, just very generous and just entirely magnanimous people. And he asked me if I um, um, was a Christian. I, I, I told him, no, no, I'm not. And he, um, he, he indicated to me that I had to have um, the atoning uh, that I obtained through the belief in the first century uh, teachings. I indicated to him that uh, apparently that I, 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 I didn't think I did. And I asked him what his religious background was, and curiously enough, he was Jewish. Curiously, he was Jewish. And I, I said to him, uh, you've been to Yom Kippur service several times, haven't you, sir? And he said, yes, of course. I said, well, you remember the book of of uh, Yonah, yes, which it's an integral part of the Yom Kippur service. And I said, uh, you'll notice that there was no um, 
crucifixion or there was no blood sacrifice. There was no atoning blood of any kind. There's no mention that there was any sacrifice by the Ninevites. There is one short mention that the, that the sailors made a sacrifice and took vows, yes. But the Ninevites didn't, and their entire city was saved, their entire country. And they came up to be uh, one of the greatest historical, uh, historically speaking, one of the greatest empires in, in history. Yes. We, we, uh, the, um, the lessons from Nineveh, the lessons uh, uh, that, that were learned by the prophet Jonah at Nineveh can benefit us all today and, and in the future as well. I will be discussing the, the, the significance of the um, Yom Kippur the, uh, the, the laws that have been handed down over the generations from Yom, uh, that, that relate to Yom Kippur and some of the prayers that are offered at Yom Kippur. And I'm, of course, since, I'll, since the name of this class is, you'll remember, the Noahide side. <laughs> yes, I will be um, um, doing it from the Noahide side. How are the, are, 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 is Yom Kippur strictly? A Jewish feast? Do you think so? Do you think that um, Yom Kippur is uh, only for people from one country? Do you think that that is what the lesson of Yonah was? Is that the people of Israel were the only ones who are worth being saved? No, no of course not. Starting next week, we'll be talking about Yom Kippur, and I have uh, invited Rabbi Kolakovsky to join me in making a construct of a Yom Kippur observance for Noahides. I hope he takes me up on that offer. I would uh, very much, I would very much enjoy working with Rabbi Kolakovsky and others, perhaps, on this important project, repentance for the uh, non-Jew under the umbrella of Torah. Yom Kippur, using the, the insights from the book of Yonah that we have been so graciously afforded that have come down to us through the ages. That's what Israel is to me in, in many respects. Israel has served as the vessel for the Torah and the Torah wisdom, the Torah fullness, the Torah knowledge. Israel has served as the vessel that has preserved the Torah for us here today. Yes, and how fortunate we are to be able to study Torah the way that we do. I'm going to tell a fast story. That is General Eisenhower later became president, but um, when General Eisenhower was being considered for the job, President Roosevelt was asking around and trying to find out who should be appointed the head Allied General for the European theater. This is about 1941 or 1942. And President Roosevelt asked uh, all the generals who, who uh, they thought should be promoted. And he finally asked um, General Douglas MacArthur, who he thought should be promoted to be general of the European theater. Douglas MacArthur was the general of the Pacific theater, you'll remember. Without hesitating, General MacArthur said, I think it should be Dwight Eisenhower. Franklin Roosevelt couldn't understand. Dwight Eisenhower was a one-star general who wasn't even on the, 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 uh, the first page of possible candidates. And Douglas MacArthur said, I know General Eisenhower. He was my major 
yeah. served under me in the Philippines for a number of years. And in the Phil when you're in the Philippines, you're a long way from communication with Washington. And very frequently, the general in the Philippines has to act on his own without having the luxury of communicating with Washington a couple of times a day. And I, I trained uh, Dwight Eisenhower, Douglas MacArthur continued, and the, he, he insisted that Dwight Eisenhower had the ability to have the perspective of the president. When Yona fled to Tarshish, he did not have the perspective of the president. When Yona was in the boat with the sailors, Yona did not have the perspective of the president. You see? Even when Yona was vomited up on the beach, he was turned into fish vomit. Can you imagine? Even then, he did not have the, the perspective of the president, so to speak. And even when he was on his way to Nineveh, he still didn't have the perspective of the president. And when he preached the repentance to the Ninevites, he wasn't doing it because he had the perspective of the president. He didn't have God's perspective, no. But he, he knew that he was going to be punished by God if he didn't do what he was told. Yes. And even when he was lying there in his booth, depressed that God had saved the Ninevites, it certainly seemed that Yonah didn't have God's perspective. How about us? Do we have God's viewpoint on this matter? Do we have God's viewpoint clearly in mind? Well, I hope so. And continuing next week, we will be um, concluding Yonah and further dovetailing it into uh, Yom Kippur and how the, the, the repentance and the, the universal principles of um, uh, mercy, attributes of God's mercy as expounded in Exodus uh, chapter 34 verses 5 and continuing are universal in their nature. I want to thank you for joining me this evening. Once again, I'm Reverend Roger Grattan, and um, I uh, am grateful to having had the opportunity to spend time with you this evening. In closing, can we say, <clears throat> Blessed is Hashem, the Blessed One. Blessed is Hashem for all eternity. Blessed are you, Adonai, our King and Creator. Blessed are you, Adonai, Giver of the Torah. It's my wish that as you go your way, that God would richly bless each and every one of you. Okay. Thank you very much for tuning in.